This is a scripted dialogue based on actual conversations I've had with various conservative Christians on the topic of hell. Of all the reasons for rejecting Christianity, I think the issue of hell is the strongest reason of all. When I was in the third grade, I started to get these horrible stomach aches. My parents took me to the hospital and they did tests, but they couldn't really determine what caused them. After a few weeks, they just went away on their own, and I've never had them since. But during the short time I did have them, I felt physically just awful. I remember sitting on the toilet one day going through one of these episodes and thinking to myself, Oh man, the only reason I can take this is because I know it'll go away after a few minutes. But then the thought occurred to me, what if they didn't go away? What if they never subsided? That must be what hell is like. Endless, never-ending, severe pain. And that thought terrified me. I knew I'd have to get to the bottom of this. Is there really a hell, or is it an obscenely cruel idea used by religion to manipulate people? I've heard many people express how the doctrine of hell has sabotaged their ability to find joy in their lives. Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote this, I can truly say, after an experience of 70 years, that all the cares and anxieties, the trials and disappointments of my whole life, are light when balanced with my sufferings in childhood and youth from the theological dogmas which I sincerely believed. I believed myself a veritable child of the evil one, and suffered endless fears, lest he should come some night and claim me as his own. To me, he was a personal, ever-present reality, crouching in a dark corner of the nursery. So let's see how a variety of Christians try to justify this loathsome, spiritually twisted idea of hell. Hell is a free will choice. I look for indicators for the truth or falsity of Christianity. For example, for me, an indicator that Catholicism is false is the Inquisition. No organization claiming to be God's representative should be torturing people to death. To me, that's a disproof of Catholicism. And I'm guessing that you, as a Protestant, would agree with me on that, right? Agree. There's nothing Christian about torturing people. Yeah, I think the Inquisition is a good disproof of the Catholic Church. Okay, but... Coercion and violence is a fundamental feature of Protestantism also, is it not? I'm not coercing you, I'm trying to persuade you. There's a difference. Right, you're not threatening me with violence in this life, like the Catholic Inquisition did, but you are threatening me with violence in an afterlife. You are saying that if I don't believe in Christianity, I'm going to burn in hell. There's a big difference between my trying to persuade you to repent of your sins and your unbelief and someone saying I'm going to torture you until you say you believe. Right, right, I get the difference. But I'm pointing out that ultimately you are threatening me with violence by your basic doctrine of hell. And I'm saying that your theology is horribly cruel and unfair. Atheists who lead good lives are all going to hell, regardless of the good they've done in their lives. Well, it's, it seems unfair from your point of view, I understand that. Is it not objectively unfair? Decent people going to hell? But God has provided a way for you not to go to hell, and if you choose to go to your grave not using the way God has provided, then that's your choice. God has given you the freedom to believe or not to believe. So you think it's fair that the person sitting right in front of you, me, will be going to hell for not believing? It's not what I think, it's what God thinks. Yeah, but you agree with that God, so it is what you think.
What is hell? It's eternal conscious torment. Hell is the absence of God's presence. Okay, yeah, that's part of it, yes, but it's not just that. You always skip over the bad part. It is also conscious, severe torment. And it's forever. How can you believe in a God that tortures people forever? It's not God who does the torturing. It's we who choose the path. But it is God who does the torturing. Whether or not we have free will, that, that's not the point. The point is the cruelty of the punishment, the setup by God. I can give you an analogy. A third grade teacher says it's getting noisy in here. The next person that talks, I'm going to cut their hand off. The kid talks, she cuts his hand off. Whoa! Well, it was his free will choice. He was clearly warned it was his free will choice. But free will is not the issue. The issue is the cruelty of the punishment. And you Christians do that all the time. You're always instinctively deflecting from the real point, trying to avoid the issue. Needing an open heart. Do you speak with your God? Yeah, I do. I think I do. How do you speak with him? I just think, and he knows that I'm thinking. And he speaks to me, not tangibly, of course, but through reason and compassion. I think those are the two ways God speaks to us. That's my interpretation of how God speaks to us. Whatever reason dictates, that's what he wants us to do. Whatever compassion dictates, that's what he wants us to do. In my opinion, God does not speak through a holy book or a church or a person like Jesus. He speaks to us directly through reason and compassion. And those two things are available to everybody, no matter what culture they're born in. And God is very non-intervening, and he's a very mixed entity, and he's not a sure thing. You know why I asked you that question about speaking to God? Because hearts that are honest and sincere seek to know the truth. That's me. God reveals himself to them. Yeah, well, I find your biblical God has revealed himself to me to be false. Because you have already come with a made-up mind. Well, at this point, yeah. But I've been at this for decades. I've come to some conclusions. So your mind is already made up. Yes, at this point, yes. I mean, when I was 20, it wasn't. Not even in my late 30s. I finished reading the Bible through for a second time. And I concluded, okay, this is not true. But then I said, I have to be sure. I have to be humble. I have to talk to people, to believers. Maybe I'm missing something. So over the next few years, I talked to about a hundred different people. Priests, ministers, Christian professors, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, atheists and sat down with them like we're doing here. I went over all these issues, and at the end I said, geez, you know, I think I'm right. None of these people, the Christians, had good answers to my questions. Nothing to do with my ego, or my wants, or desires, or preferences. My mission has always been pure, to figure out the truth about religion. And all these Christians, they did not come up with good answers. That's why I'm asking you if you talk to God. If you speak to the biblical God, he will answer you. But your heart really needs to be open, to listen. I will not open my heart to a God who condones slavery. I will not open my heart to a God who orders genocides. I will not open my heart to a God who has a hell. Hell is an immoral, awful, extremist idea. Let me put it this way. I'm asking you to listen to Jesus. I have listened to him and what he taught, and I find he teaches the wrong things. He's a religious extremist. He overstates everything. He says you can walk on water, which you can't. He says good people go to hell if they don't believe in him as the Savior, which is the mindset of a religious fanatic. So how do you expect him to speak to you if your mind is already made up? Well, no, this is after he spoke to me. He already has spoken to me through his words in the Bible, and I... Right. So whatever he tells you, you will not accept it. Jesus will not force himself on you or anybody. He never does. 
I'm supposed to accept the idea of hell. Jesus never forces himself. See, you're avoiding the issue. This is not about whether Jesus forces himself on people or not. It's about whether hell is an acceptable idea. I'm supposed to accept hell as a good idea? I think your Catholic upbringing might be influencing you. This idea that God relishes sending people to hell. Maybe you have that feeling to a greater or lesser degree. No, I'm not saying your God relishes sending people to hell. I'm saying your God does send people to hell. And that means my good atheist friend is going to hell. And that I'm going to hell. And that my deceased sister is already in hell. And that means six million Jews who died in the Holocaust, not as Christians, but as Jews, are in hell. What kind of a religion is this? It's an intolerant, small-minded religion, a false religion. That's why I'm saying it would be very helpful if you can open your heart and speak with Jesus. Ask him questions without already judging. Oh, you send people to hell. He's going to answer me? He's going to give me a good explanation as to how hell is a good idea? He answers. Really? My question to him is, how is hell a good idea? How is it an expression of justice and love? To me, it's not. It's an expression of injustice and hatred. A classic example of religious extremism. And Jesus is going to say what? Ah, oh, you got to trust me, Mick. Once you're in heaven, I'll be able to explain to you how black is actually white and how hate is actually love. No, I think Jesus was a religious fanatic who didn't think things through, but liked to spout over-the-top ideas because people love to hear that kind of stuff. In God is both love and justice. In God you find love, judgment, and mercy. There is no mercy in hell. It is forever. Torturing forever is not mercy. According to Jesus, I and my non-Christian friends are going to hell to be tortured endlessly, severely. Revelation 20.10 And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Well, the game's not over yet. It's over for my sister. She didn't accept Christianity. God knows hearts, and that's the thing. We, we don't know the state of anyone's inner heart. I know my sister did not believe in Christianity. And I know the majority of six million Jews in the Holocaust did not, in their hearts, actually believe in Jesus. You're just grasping at straws trying to justify your horrible theology. Psalm 147.9 says, The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. He does not have compassion on those in hell. They are there forever endlessly suffering. Three Interpretations of Hell There isn't just one interpretation of hell. There are essentially three interpretations. The first one is the traditional one of eternal conscious torment, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Right. A second interpretation that has some biblical support is annihilationism, that those who are not saved simply die, they simply cease to exist. Some verses that support that view are Psalm thirty-seven, thirty-eight: all sinners will be destroyed, there will be no future for the wicked. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. And Psalm 37.20, but the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall vanish. Into smoke they shall vanish away. And a third interpretation is universalism, the idea that ultimately everyone is saved and reconciled with God. Luke 3.6, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. John twelve thirty one to 32 I will draw all peoples to myself. And Romans five eighteen. Therefore, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. So the concept of hell or the afterlife for sinful people is not as simple as one would think. You don't necessarily have to think of hell as people burning in hell. I think there are major, major problems with that assessment. For one thing, 
those three alternative interpretations are contradictory. They are contradictory. They can't all three be true. You can't cease to exist yet continue to suffer. You can't suffer forever yet be ultimately reconciled. The Bible is not clear about the afterlife. Jesus is not clear about the afterlife. It's fine to say you do not know the nature of the afterlife, but you can't be asserting it is three mutually exclusive concepts. Eternal conscious torment, annihilation, and universalism. Also, the traditional interpretation of hell as eternal conscious torment is the historically predominant one. And if you believe in the guiding force of the Holy Spirit, then that's the one you need to choose. The way I look at it is that any Savior, Jesus, who allows his followers to interpret hell as eternal conscious torment, who allows that concept to flourish, and who does not vigorously and clearly oppose it at every turn, has failed in his role as God's representative. He has taught fanaticism and hatred, not love and justice. Keeping an open heart Because from what you have said so far, it shows me that you have not even been ready to receive God, if he were to speak to you. That is not true at all. Not true at all. I had my heart completely open to God in two different situations in my life, very serious situations. I wanted some sign from him, anything. I didn't expect the big voice in the sky coming down or anything like that, but some sign to clear up the problem or at least give me some direction which way to go. And both times, there was nothing. Nothing. God did not speak. So I concluded that God, if he exists, is a non-intervening God. Other than being the ultimate source for nature and life. But I want to get back to hell. Because I don't think you answered that issue at all. From the Holocaust, six million Jews are in hell now. Not just separated from God, but suffering severely. And will be forever. You don't know that. Yes, I do. Because that's what it says in here, your Bible. That is your theology. That's what it says. Where do you come off changing your Holy Scripture? John 3.18, he who does not believe is condemned already. That's really clear. And those six million Jews did not die as believing Christians. They died as Jews. And another thing. Isn't it odd that this book, with its alleged broad perspective, did not predict the Holocaust, one of the most important chapters in Jewish history? In fact, I came across this passage, which predicts the exact opposite of the Holocaust, Isaiah 54, 13-14. And great shall be the peace of your children. Speaking about the Hebrews. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear and far from terror, for it shall not come near you. Really? Endless Christian Rationalizations for Hell I've heard all kinds of rationalizations for hell from Christians. Probably the most common one is that hell is symbolic. It's just symbolic language. I agree with you that that claim is bogus. Yes, the imagery of fire and flames, like in Dante's Inferno, is symbolic language. But the purpose of symbolic language is to point to an underlying reality. Symbolic language does not erase that underlying reality. In fact, it makes it even more terrifying. Because what horrible reality can such severe imagery of fire and flames be depicting? Right, exactly. I appreciate that you're not soft-peddling the concept of hell. And yet you believe that hell is a valid concept, from a valid religion, from a valid God. Well, I believe that is what Jesus thought, and he is the Son of God, so I have to believe it. I take an opposite approach. I believe that because Jesus taught hell, he is therefore not the Son of God. Because the idea of hell is such an unloving, cruel concept. I remember a priest once telling me, 
almost jauntily <laughs> that we have to believe in hell, but we don't have to believe anyone is actually in there. Oh, I wouldn't agree with that idea. Jesus does not imply that at all. He said the gate is narrow. He said many are called, but few are chosen. Right, right. Yeah, to claim there is no one or hardly anyone in hell is not a valid proposal. I've heard Christians claim the word eternal does not necessarily mean eternal, but could mean just for a very long time. But I say eternal means eternal. It doesn't mean for a very long time. Eternal is the word expert translators chose to use. Right, and if you're going to deny that hell is eternal, then wouldn't you also have to deny heaven is eternal, and yet the Bible presents heaven as eternal? Yeah. I've heard the argument that in rejecting the Christian God, you have slapped him in the face, and since you violated an infinite God, you deserve infinite punishment. If you slap a playmate, you deserve some level of punishment. If you slap a teacher, a worse level of punishment. If you slap a police officer, a worse level of punishment. Slapping God, you deserve infinite punishment. Again, I agree with you that that is not a good argument. The severity of a punishment should be commensurate with the crime, not the status of the person violated. Yeah. I think a very common criticism non-Christians have is, how is it fair that people who have not heard of Jesus are assigned to hell, simply because they have not heard of him? Well, that issue is clearly dealt with in the Bible by Paul. The unreached have general revelation. God is evident even though people may not have been exposed to the specifics of the gospel. Romans 1, 20 to 21 for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. Well, as a lot of atheists, for whom the invisible attributes of God are not clearly seen, despite their sincere efforts, <laughs> and there are a lot of people in other religions who do not glorify the same God Paul believes in, your religion sends all Muslims and all Jews and all Hindus to hell because they believe in the wrong God. At least you're not soft-peddling hell as merely separation from God. You seem to acknowledge the severity of hell is more than just a dismal place. Yes, I do think hell is a place of eternal conscious torment, not just an unhappy place. And without Jesus' sacrifice, that is where everyone deserves to be. Yes. I think that's a horribly negative assessment of humanity and a horribly unloving God. Well, I've enjoyed this discussion. I appreciate that we were able to discuss issues with mutual respect instead of rancor. Yeah, yeah, but uh, don't misunderstand. I, in fact, do not respect your position at all. <laughs> I think accepting the concept of hell is a harmful and evil thing to do. Speaking candidly, I think you should actually be ashamed of yourself for believing what you do. Sorry, but that that's what I think. Mm -hmm.